Namaste Guru Devaya Sarva Siddhi Pradayine Sarva Mangala Rupaya Sarva Ananda Vidayine Radha Sanmukha Sam Saktim Saki Sangha Nivasinim Tamaham Satatam Bande Guru Rupam Param Sakhim Radha Pada Shrita Sarve Gauri Kripa Prasadata Siddh Prema Rase Magna Bande Tan Gauri Jeevanan Vansha Kalpa Taru Vascha Kripa Sindhu Vecha Patitanam Pavanevyo Vaishnavevyo Namo Namo Abir Palipati Purta Kanta Dasya Vilasati Balasavara Shirupa Chintamalam Sakti Samisto Matswanta Dudanta Hai Churastan Manamana Sabilasa Shirupa Chinta Savalita San Shiradika Dasya Tishtatu Iti Bhavaha Yam Pravajanta Manu Peta Mapeta Kritam Taipaya No Virha Kata Raju Hava Putretti Tanma Tayata Ravu Vinedu Tam Sarva Bhuta Ridayam Munimana Tosmi Nitananda Namastubhyam Premananda Pradayine Kaloka Masanasa Shijana Vapatae Nama Navodjala Dibhava Navidana Karma Paragam Vichitra Gaura Bhakti Sindhu Rasa Bangala Sinam Suragamaga Darshakam Vrajadivasa Dayakam Vajamyaham Gadadharam Supanditam Gurum Prabhu Radha Krishna Pranaya Vikritir Ladini Shakti Rasma Ekatmana Vapibhuvi Pura Deha Vedam Gatoto Chaitanya Kam Pakatamaduna Taddayam Chaikam Aptam Radha Bhava Dyuti Suvalitam Nomi Krishna Swarupam Keli Vihitaya Marajuna Banjana Sulalita Charita Nikila Janaranjana Lochana Nartana Jita Chalakandana Mam Paripala Kali Yadandana Mahabhava Swarupam Tam Krishna Priya Variyasi Prema Bhakti Prade Devi Radhike Tvam Namam Yaham Radhe Vrindavinadi Shai Karunamrita Vahini Kripaya Nija Padabja Dasyam Maryam Pradeetam Tambula Pana Pada Madana Pada Navisara Divir Vrindaranyam Maheshwarim Pratayaya Stosayanti Priya Prana Prista Saki Kurada Pikila Sankochita Bhumika Keli Bhumi Shurupa Mandari Mukha Stadasika Sankshvayas Mukunda Murali Ravasavana Fularidvala Vikadamba Kakarambita Pratikadamba Kunjantara Kalinda Giri Nandini Kamala Kanda Landalina Sugandira Nilena Me Sharanamastu Vrindati Vini Vrindai Tulasi Devai Prai Keshava Sacha Krishna Bhakti Bhada Devi Sattavattai Namorana Radhesha Keli Prabhuta Vinoda Vinyasa Vigyam Vajra Panditambi Kripalu Tadakila Vishwavandam Shipona Masyam Shirsanamana Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhunita Ananda Shri Taita Gadada Shiva Sadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 First of all, I have a done with Pranam for the Lord's feet of our Holy Master. Parimaraditam Shri Rupada Padma, Nitlera Padishtam Vishnu Pada, Shtotar Shati Shishimad, Bhakti Viranta Shri Narayan Goswami Maharaj. In my same done with Pranam in the dust of the Lord's feet of our Param Guru Devs, Nitlera Padishtam Shri Bhakti Pragyan Kesha Goswami Maharaj, Nitlera Padishtam Shri Bhakti Viranta Swami Maharaj. Nitya Lurpa Vishtashila Bhakti Jeevan Janadam Goswami Maharaj To all the 
Guru 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 Vaga to all Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis. Everyone, please accept my pranam. Please give your blessings that I can try to glorify the name, form, qualities, and pastimes of the Lord for all of our spiritual betterment. So, so happy to come to New York. I've been thinking about it a lot, even being in Vrindavan, but thinking more and more about coming here. Especially, I got excited hearing about we'll have a program in Hunter College on the theme of bhakti, poetry in the bhakti lineage. I got so excited about that that I thought for the entire week in New York I just want to speak about poetry and the bhakti lineage. How crucial, how essential it is, and how they're interdependent. <laughs> pure poetry and pure devotion. Completely interdependent. So, especially we the greatest poet of all time, the greatest Vaishnava, and also the greatest poet. Coincidence, is it? Sri Rupa Goswami Pad. There are college university courses in Harvard and Oxford on the medieval devotional poetry of Sri Rupa Goswami. You can get like PhD degrees in uh, the study of Rupa Goswami's poetry. Because he's recognized as being the absolute emperor of poets, even by mundaners, even by um, logicians and academics, they realize that this person's genius is unprecedented, coming from another place. You know, all types of poetic arts, alliteration and rhythm and um, metaphor and you know, Sanskrit is so complicated and it has to be so perfect, it's like a mathematic code. Computer programmers, when they want to go very deep into their computer programming, they actually have to use Devanagari script, they use Sanskrit, because there's 50 characters, which is more than the 26 characters of the English alphabet. Anyway, I don't want to go off course too much, but Sanskrit is the oldest and the most exalted linguistic you know, researchers are all uh, completely in love with the Sanskrit language because it's so perfect and so beautiful. But it's so complicated, and it's you have to be like a computer programming mentality to do it. But Srila Rupa Goswami, with a little copan sitting in the dust of Vrindavan, and a little pen scratching on a palm leaf, he's working out in his mind all these complicated uh, math problems of Sanskrit grammar, just as if it's nothing to him. Just like the way that he would breathe, the Sanskrit rules are following behind his conceptions. So we want to speak about him, but... Before Rupa Goswami came, there were other poets, and especially, we start a little bit tonight with Bilva Mungo, Shri Bilva Mungo Thakur. <coughs> but, what does it mean, what is poetry? Poetry means like, someone said, a friend of mine, he, he says that, what is politics? Politics means how to say as little as possible with the most amount of words. You know, big speech, just to fill up space. You're not really telling anything, just cheating people. How to say as little as possible with the most words. But poetry is the opposite. How to say as much as possible with the least amount of words. How to make a sutra, how to make compress so many deep meanings and different angles of thought, even multiple meanings and um, so many things into a small little phrase like Vedanta Sutras and all the sutras, all the verses of Srimad Bhagavatam are like that all the, all the verses of all scripture are actually poems, they're verses of poetry and so many essential meanings and uh, flavors and conceptions are compressed into just a tiny little thing and if you chew on that if you unzip that zip file, then unlimited knowledge and, and rasa comes out. So, 
poetry in bhakti means kirtan. Kirtan doesn't only mean Nam Kirtan, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Kirtan means to use our organ of speech to glorify the name and form and qualities and pastimes and associates and abode and paraphernalia of the Supreme Absolute Truth. To sing about that, to glorify that, to raise our, our life breath, our prawn, to fill the atmosphere with the glories of God by speech. And this is so dear, especially in Kali Yuga, we hear so much, and we'll hear more and more this week about Kirtan Mahima, the glories and the speciality of this limb of devotional service. So many hearing and remembering and serving and going on Parikrama and offering Pranam. Special glory of Kirtan, though. We'll hear more and more about that this week, but just for now we say that Kirtan Bhakti is so dear to Krishna that even he becomes enchanted and he wants to do his own kirtan also. Srila Rupa Goswami says Dishi Dishi Shukasari Mandala Gudalila Pakata Manupatad Bir Nirmitas Chayampura Tadati Rahasi Bretam Prayasi Karnamule Smita Mukama Bijapan Bhati Kunje Vihari He's saying that Shikunja Bihari Krishna, that supreme absolute truth, who is a person, who is a barefoot, flower crowned Kunja Bihari, an enjoyer in the groves of Braj. He's giving us in this verse one snapshot of that supreme lord, Shikunja Bihari Bhagavan, saying, Dishi Dishi Shukasari Mandala Gudalila, that sometimes when Shri Krishna's in the groves, the braj, then in mandala, guda, lila, in all directions, like a mandala, like a circle, sukrasari, all the parrots begin to sing about his confidential pastimes. Because these kunjas, where Krishna's enjoying his highest type of pastimes with his highest devotees, very secret things, and no one can go there except the most exalted and perfected souls, the highest lovers of God, the braja gopis, only they go there. Even Mother Yashoda is so exalted, so glorious, she has no idea about that seva and that pastimes going on there. Gambling matches and joking and everything going on, these playful pastimes of Krishna and his beloveds. No one knows, except for those who are in the pastimes, but also parrots, because they're everywhere, little birds, all the animals in the forest and the trees and creepers. They see everything. And so... Rupa Goswami is saying that sometimes what those parrots have seen, those beautiful pastimes that they've drunk with their eyes and become stunned watching, that they will start to sing in their own language, chirping and singing. And when Sri Krishna hears that, the birds doing kirtan of his qualities and pastimes, he becomes enchanted and stunned as he listens. And then he becomes so elated that he can't keep it inside. He becomes so filled up with the joy of that kirtan, the happiness of hearing that kirtan, that it, the dam fills to the limit, and his mouth, his own mouth, smiling mouth, begins to spill. He turns to his beloved, to Shimati Radhika, and in her ear, with his teeth like pearls or shiny moons, illuminating her golden cheek, he's laughing and whispering in her ear what the parrots are saying. So he's enjoying that kirtan, relishing it through his ear, and then he's also relishing to speak it himself. This is one type of Krishna, Karnamrita. The nectar that Krishna puts in the karna, in the ear of his beloved. But also Krishna Karnamrita means that kirtan, which is nectar for the ears of Krishna. And Krishna Karnamrita, of course, is a famous book of poetry by Sri Bilva Mangal Thakur. Great, great Vaishnava saint. He lived way far, long before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu when he went to South India, he, when he came back from his tour of South India to Puri, he said, I brought two jewels with me. These two books that he found, Brahma Samhita, Govinda Madhipurusham, Tamaham Bajami, and Sri Krishna Karnamrita. Sri Brahma Samhita is like the greatest possible, the greatest scripture on Krishna Tattva, establishing who is Krishna, what is his abode, his transcendental reality. 
and Krishna Kornamrita is pure rasa, especially in the mood of Braj Gopis, which Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was so eager to taste. So I want to speak about that Krishna Kornamrita, Yoga Mangal Thakur. Yoga Mangal Thakur in South India on the banks of um, Krishna Vedi, Krishna Vedi River. He was a Brahmin. And he would meditate on one bank of the river. And after taking his bath and doing his Brahminical duties, oblations and Gayatri Mantra, he would sit and meditate there. But across the river, on the other side, not so far away from where he lived, there was one house, the home, actually like a palace, of Chintamani. She was a prostitute. But in Vedic culture, and in, especially in former times, prostitute doesn't mean what you see on the streets of New York. Prostitute means an extremely educated uh, lady. She's so much expert in singing, in dancing, in all different arts. And she's independent, and she's fabulously wealthy, because uh, she's so expert how to um, satisfy and, and conquer the minds of men that they give everything they have to her. She's not uh, what we think of as prostitute. So she was a very expert singer, very astonishing voice, and the expressions of her mood, her singing would carry across in the morning mist across the river, and as Bhavamanga was chanting his Brahma Gayatri, trying to meditate, the songs of Chintamani would come in his ear, and his heart became stirred by that. And slowly, slowly, it was like that voice it was like a, a hand, like a finger, come, come, come to me. Because everything, you know, her, her profession, her speciality, her whole bhav is how to allure. That's coming off of her, that's the fragrance that's emanating from her. Come to me, come to me. Whether she knew him or not, anyhow her voice was calling him and he became mad for her. And he went there, what is this beautiful music, what is this place? And he met her and became enchanted, mind stolen, and established a relationship with her. He began to give her everything secretly. He was already married, he had a very chaste wife and so good family in his high dynasty. But he became completely captured by his so-called love for her, attachment for her, and the mellows she stimulated in his heart. And it came in due course that Vilva Mangal Thakur, his father, became ill and left this world. And when they had Shraddha ceremony, Pinda, giving the last oblations for the father, all he could think was, I have to go to her, I have to be with her, I can't wait, I have to run. But he's sitting there doing his duty at the ceremony, but as soon as it's done, after Pinda, after oblations, you should go home and you shouldn't do anything else for the day. You just think about your departed one and pray for them and their destination. But instead he ran. As soon as the thing was over, he ran from there. Some say, taking the sweets that were offered there as gifts for her. Hmm. He went running to go meet with her. Couldn't wait. But a big storm came. So much rain, heavy rain was coming. It was flooded. Streets were flooded and cold. He was so absorbed in her, so much, his mind so captivated by her. Two things were burning in his heart, eagerness and absorption. Utkanta and Avesh, you mentioned last time we were here. These two things, eagerness and to be absorbed in the object for which we're eager, this is actually what we need for bhajan, for spiritual life. But that such intense, passionate longing he had fixed on Chintamani so that he didn't feel the cold. He didn't feel the rain, he didn't feel any discomfort, inconvenience. All he knew was her and running. And he came and the river was so flooded and now it's late and pouring rain and storm and no boatman. He's saying, how will I cross, how will I cross? All obstacles, he's like on a horse galloping over them, not dissuaded by anything. And he saw there floating in the water, there was actually one corpse had been thrown. And he held on with one arm to that floating corpse, and with another arm, he swam across the river. 
and because the river was zigzagging like that, you know, one bank to another like this, so easily, almost the current pushed him like that, and he was thinking, oh, Chintamani's cares about me so much, she arranged this float for me. She arranged a way for me to come to her. He's so absorbed in her, he's thinking, she did everything for me. She can't wait for me to come. And he came to her house, and now it was late, and the door was closed, the gate was locked, and it's pouring rain, and too much thunder and sound, he can't call, she can't hear. And so he grabbed, he looked and saw one rope hanging there from the wall. From a hole in the wall, a rope was coming out. Oh, look, she's so thoughtful. She has to close the gate to protect from thieves because she has so much wealth, but she knew I would come. And so just to increase my eagerness, she made this rope for me. Really, it's a big black snake hanging from, coming out of a hole in the wall. But he caught hold of a deadly serpent and began to scale the wall. And just when he got to the top, it was so wet, and the snake slipped, and he tumbled from there and crashed like into the discarded pots and big noise. And the lights came on. What is that? What is that? The maid servants came out with a lantern and Shintamani covered with a blanket over her head. What is that? They came and saw, oh my God, it's Bilba Mongo. Unconscious, fallen in the mud. And they brought him inside and put him on the couch. And when he came to consciousness, he opened his eyes and saw the face of Shintamani. Oh, my beloved. Oh, she shook her head in disgust. My God, for this body, which is made of blood and bones and full of stool and urine, how you become mad, how you're so crazy for this bag of flesh. She was a prostitute by destiny. Her destiny had pushed her that way, her karma, her association. Anyhow, she'd gone that way. But in her heart, still she was faithful. Still she was a devotee. She believed in Bhagwan. And so many of the songs that she sang, they were actually devotional songs. So she knew some tattva. She wasn't an ignorant person. And when she looked at him, she shook her head and she said, This is my shame. How I've ruined your life. Brahman, raised in a good line, good family. And look how you've become degraded. Because of me, because of my profession, I've ruined you. I'm ruining society. She said, Alas. Krishna is a greedy person. He's so hungry for love and affection. If you would give him even half, even a quarter of this eagerness and absorption that you have in my flesh bag body, if you would give him even half of that much attachment and earnest longing, oh, you would be so high, saint. You would be so exalted. Because to advance in spiritual life doesn't mean just how to learn to follow the rules, how to give donations, how to be submissive to the authorities. Advancing in spiritual life depends entirely on our personal desire to be with our beloved. I want to be with you. I want to come to you. I want to know you. I want to love you. I want to please you completely. I want. That's the basis of spiritual life. Sri Ramananda Roy told Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that Krishna Bhakti Rasa Bhavitamati if you want that Krishna Ras, if you want to taste that highest mellows of devotional service, that spontaneous love that is in the hearts of the Brajabhasis of Vrindavan, if you want that Vrindavan mood, Janma Koti Sukriti Nalabhite, in millions of lifetimes of following all the rules and chanting your rounds and giving donations and waking up early in the morning and doing everything right that you're supposed to do and being a yes man for the authorities above, you'll never get it. Not ever. There's one price to enter that realm. And who doesn't have that ticket, that golden ticket, will never, ever, in millions, Janma Koti Sukriti Nalabhite. In millions of lifetimes of collecting Sukriti, never they'll get it. But if you have that ticket, you will get it very quickly. What is that? Lobham. Greed. I want. I want it so bad. I don't want anything else. Actually, Sri Prabhupada, he established ISKCON after this verse. Mm. Krishna, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Krishna Rasa Bhavita Mati. That Mati consciousness which is infused with Krishna Bhakti Ras. It means Raghunuga Bhakti. The International Society for Raghunuga Bhakti in the line of the Brajabhasis of Vrindavan. 
That's what it means. He told that. This, my society, if Krishna consciousness means this. He told right there the sutra. His sutra to the whole world is, my society is not to teach you how to follow all the rules and regulations and that, let that be enough. The rules and regulations are the platform for your desire to dance upon. So Chintamani, she told him, if you had such one fraction, just a little piece, just anything, this type of greed that you have for me, this love you think is for me, this attachment, if you had just a half of that for Krishna, you would be so high, so exalted. You would have that golden ticket. You would enter into that narrow path that few find. And because he was so absorbed in her, when she spoke these words, Oh, you're so degraded, you're so degraded. When she spoke these sharp words to him, it went so deep into his heart. Someone can speak sharply to us, but if we don't know them or don't care, then it doesn't mean so much. But he was so absorbed in her, so her heart so soft, so melted in her hands, that when she put this impression, it went so deep. And in a moment, his heart cracked, and he understood she's telling me the truth. Also, he had, from his previous life, so many good impressions, but had fallen in this life. But it hit him hard, and he got up from there, still wet from outside, and he walked out the door. He left everything. He didn't go back to his family, and he said, I'll go to Vrindavan. I'll go there, and I'll give what she's told me right, she's told me the truth. I'll go to Vrindavan, and I'll give my loving attachment to Sri Krishna. Why I'm wasting my life, how I become degraded swimming across the river on a dead body just to enjoy with a prostitute. And so, he was on his way going to Vrindavan. <clears throat> and on the way, after many days, because going from South India to Uttar Pradesh, this long journey, it takes a few months. And on the way, one place he became thirsty, he came to a well. And that time, it wasn't like, now there's pumps everywhere, but to speak of government giving water everywhere. But that time there was one pump and maybe ten villages around. And the ladies all would come walking two, three, five kilometers with their pots on their heads and fill up from the well and take back for cooking and cleaning and everything. And so many ladies are there at the well and he's waiting. He has no pot and no rope. And all the ladies, they all have their duty to do it. So they all told him, okay, okay, I have to go quickly, but she will give, someone else will give. So one after the next, they were neglecting him. And he was sitting there at the well. And finally, when all had gone, who's the lowest on the pecking order, the youngest new wife? You know, all the senior ladies, they get to go first. And then after they'd all finished, there was one young girl left, just married, new bride. She said, I'll give you water. And she, as she was leaning to put that pot in, old Bilva Mungu, he noticed her beauty. And as she drew up the pot of water, he was watching her. And when she gave, poured her pot, he held his hands like this, and he drank from his hands, and drank with his eyes her beauty. She saw him, and she noticed by his body language and his eyes, this sadhu is not proper. Hmm. Something not right about this person. She could see he wasn't proper, and so she left. But she looked over her shoulder, and he was following behind her. He thought in his mind, my God. As he was going, he noticed, my God, look, my feet are going by themselves. I left everything. I ruined my life, and then my heart was broken open, and I saw the light of truth. And I left everything for Krishna to go to Vrindavan to do bhajan. But look at me. Look at my feet. I left that path, and without even noticing, automatically looked on it, walking after this lady, watching her from behind. And he lamented in his heart. And when she came home, she went inside the house and closed the door. And her husband came and he noticed, hey, there's one sadhu outside. And he went and opened the door to him. He said, Maharaj, can I help you? Can I give you something? Some alms? He said, yes, I will take alms. I will take donation, but not from you, from your new wife, your young bride. Of this strange request, but anyhow, sadhus, you can't understand their mind sometimes. Mm. Very difficult person, transcendental avadut, with our mind, our paradigm, can't understand them. And if we try, we can really make a 
problem for ourselves. And so he called his wife. Hey, this daughter's coming and he wants to take alms but only from your hand. And she said, he's not right. He's not a good sadhu. I met him at the well and I saw his eyes are hungry. He's not proper. He said, anyhow, you should go and give him. I'm standing here, don't worry, but we cannot neglect him. So he went and she said, yes, Maharaj, what can I give you? He said, I want your hairpin. Okay, another strange request from a strange person. She took out her hairpin, and he, two pieces like this, and he broke in two. He said, oh, my eyes, you are the cause of all my trouble. If I didn't have eyes to see the beauty of this world, the beauty of these ladies, then I couldn't become attached. I couldn't become entangled. If I didn't know where there's no bamboo, there can be no flute. So burn down a bamboo forest and no more flutes. So on my eyes, this is your last I give you now. You drink as much as you want. You look at this beauty as the last time you'll see. And he looked at that girl in her eyes and she said, what is he doing? He's a strange person. And he took these two pins and punched out his eyes. And like a syringe, he was spraying blood from his eyes and he fell on the ground. Ah, Krishna, ah, Krishna. Ah, Karuna Sindhu, oh, ocean of mercy, oh, friend of the fallen. Lamenting and rolling on the ground and crying. She understood at that time. She had thought, this person is not good. He's bad. He's a lusty person in the guise of a sadhu. This is not right. But she couldn't understand his heart. Oh, that he still had some little cancer in there. Really, he'd already given his heart, but the cancer wasn't completely cured yet. But he had one thing to rectify himself, which is lamentation. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita that if someone is completely dedicated to him, even if they fall down, even if they do something terrible, still you should consider them a sadhu. It's a very, very delicate point. Because mm -hmm. we can say that there's so many people in the world that they're sadhu. Mm -hmm. You know, they have thousands and thousands of followers. You know, they have their own TV channel on the Hindu network. You know, they build gigantic mm, Italian marble uh, mandirs in Vrindavan. <coughs> thousands and thousands of people, they say they're sadhus, but they exploit their female disciples or children or extract money for improper purposes. And they do so many rotten things, but people say, oh, they're transcendental, or even he's Bhagavan, you can't say anything. And they cite this verse of Bhagavad Gita, even Apichet Sudharasu. But there's a, there's a clause for this verse. Someone is to be considered a sadhu, or he's still saintly and he's still pure, even if he falls and does something terrible, if he laments, if he has pain in his heart, tapa, if he burns, oh, alas, alas, Lord, I want to serve you. I want to give my heart to you. But alas, alas, your maya is so powerful. And my addiction runs so deep from so many lifetimes, so deep my impression, my attachment to this world. I'm so conquered. That person, Krishna is telling Arjuna, very quickly he will become purified and exalted. So don't judge him. Mm. And in the same way, that girl she saw, oh my God, who I thought was a rotten person, look how he's burning in the fire of lamentation. He's absolutely burning. She'd never seen rolling on the ground so violently he was bruised and his skin was broken in some places. And crying as if he wanted to grind himself, like when we make sandalwood paste, you grind on a stone to make paste. He wanted to grind himself to paste on the ground. Alas, alas. Ah, Krishna, ah, Krishna. And blind, again he began to walk to Vrindavan. But blind, so how he go? Only he was wandering and he some sadhus. Also many people were traveling that pathway. Going back and forth. So he came in a group of some other Vaishnavas heading to Vrindavan and walking along with them. And all the while singing to Krishna. His whole heart purified by the tears of lamentation. Purified by the fire of repentance. When we do any sin, then we have to do some atonement. You know, take a bath in the Ganga, you offer this type of charity, you do so many things. If you kill a cow, even by accident, if you even have a cow and she's tied up, 
and she dies while she's tied up, then you're guilty of killing the cow. Then for 12 years, you with your hands behind your back, you have to eat the remnants of the cows and live in the cow shed with the cows. You can't speak to anyone for 12 years if a cow in your care dies or if you kill a cow by accident, hit with a car or anything. 12 years, the atonement for killing a cow. You have to eat the remnants of the cows off the ground, the hay and everything. Sleep in the Goshala. So many different types of atonements. Give this type of charity on this type of day. So many things to clean our sins. But to clean aparad, to clean offense. Oh, I've done offense against Guru and Vaishnavas and against the Lord. There's no way to be clean of offense except to weep. Weep and lament. Alas, Prabhu, I want to love you. I beg to love you. But my rotten nature is against. My lower nature is envious and proud and all these bad things fire of lamentation and the tears of lamentation they purified and so he became pure and his heart was cleansed of all the coverings and his natural inner bath the natural mood of the soul it began to come out and very beautiful poetry began to come from his mouth the words that he was singing were so sweet his glorification that later became Krishna Karnamrita but he was blind so he didn't write anything down but those Vaishnavas who were walking with him they heard oh my god this Baba is singing such Glorious verses, so full of deep, deep, actually, Braja Gopi's mood. The highest and most profound love of God he was expressing. The most secret things. That Braja Gopi's mood, even Radharani's mood was coming through him. He was singing verses as if it was Radharani's mouth. Radharani's own bhava was coming in his heart and he was singing those things. So sweet, such attractive poetry he was singing that Krishna himself came there. And one day as he was walking, he heard this voice, Hey Baba, where are you going? And that voice was so sweet. It was like nectar being poured in his heart. Or like, like a, it was like that voice, the breath of that voice was dusted with camphor, cooling all the heat of the summer, summer sun and all the austerities and difficulty of walking was cooled to the core of his person by hearing the sweet words of that, part, that boy. So sweet language, so sweet voice, and also like a spear turning in his heart, piercing and turning. At once the sweetest thing and a, oh, some other kind of pain is this awakening in my heart, some deep sort of longing. Baba, where are you going? Where are you going? Oh, I'm going to Vrindavan. Who are you? He said, oh, I'm also going to Vrindavan. I'm just a cowherd boy, and my job is to help those who have no other way, who can't find their way to find their way to Vrindavan. Saying directly so many things about his identity and mm. how he's bhakti but so. Now he says in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Te sam satata yukta nam bhajatam piti purvakam nidami buddhi yogam tam yenamam upayantite That those who are completely and constantly dedicated to me, I myself give them the knowledge to, by which they can come to me. And in, not in those Sanskrit verses of Bhagavad Gita, but in the broken village talk of a Rajabasi cowherd boy, he said the same thing. Oh, I take those who can't find their way. I show them the way to Vrindavan. So come with me. And he caught the hold of the hand of Bilva Mungal. And when Bilva Mungal touched that hand, so soft, lotus hand, in this hand we get calluses and sometimes rough, like sandpaper and some hard. And even we get, you know, go to manicure and get the <laughs> nails taken care of. And soak everything so many creams and <laughs> lotions and so many things we try to do but even at the, the peak of all that spend a million dollars on your hands alone there's no comparison to the softness of Sri Krishna's hand how sweet that voice was going in his heart but the touch of the Lord's hand oh it electrified him up and down in and out so much made such an eagerness in him he wanted to catch hold because Krishna's holding his hand but I want to hold on to that and with his other hand he tried to catch me he said no Baba you can't hold me I will hold you with him because actually Bilba Mungo had come to the stage of Bhav by his absolute renunciation and desire and he had these impressions in his heart and he had come to that stage and Bhav means that Krishna will come close to us in the stage of Bhav we may hear his voice we may smell his fragrance, we may feel his touch, we may feel that he's so close to me, 
but you can't hold him. Only Prem has the power to catch and hold the Lord. Then you, like Mother Yashoda, bound Damodar by mm. the belly, by her Vatsalya Prem. She could hold him when that love is perfect. But in this world, we can come as high as Bhav, that ecstasy in the Lord. Just like when a flower, the bud finally opens, or a bumblebee comes. So that Madhukara, Madhusudan, Shri Krishna, when the bud of our heart, when the sadhana is mature, that bhav awakens, mood is coming, he's attracted and he'll come. But the lotus cannot catch the bumblebee until the bumblebee is so much drunk, until that lotus is so much bloomed and so full of juice and nectar that he goes inside and the sun sets and closes and catches it in the sky. Then Prem Dasha, he can hold. So he tried to hold his hand, but couldn't hold. And then he, Krishna slipped away. And Bilva Mungo, he began to weep and lament and roll on the ground, understanding who that boy was who'd come. <clears throat> and in that time, in that lamentation, in that pain of separation, which is particularly acute after meeting, you know, Guru Maharaj would say that who knows the pain of separation? Only who has the experience of meeting. It's not enough to hear about Radha and Krishna. It's not enough to hear about them. We actually have to have some connection with them, some relationship with them. And then losing that, then separation comes. That fire blazes forth and that bhav becomes fully blossomed, fully manifested, sudipta, fully blazing. Just like if we have gold raw from the ground and you put in the furnace in blazing heat and it burns away the impurities and then gleaming pure gold comes out. So in the same way, to make our bhav perfect, to make transform bhav into prem, our Sri Krishna, he puts the sadak into the furnace fire of Vipra Lamba Bhaja, deep separation mode. So Bilva Mangal, so many verses he began to sing. And in particular he sang one. Um, Kamaniya kishore mugda morte Kalavenu konita dutana nindo Mama bachi vichin vittani murare Madurimna konika apika apika Oh, that boy, that youthful, blooming youth who is Kamaniya, who is attractive to everyone He's the essence of everything beautiful. Who has contact with him doesn't want anything else from the world or anywhere anymore. Rasa Khan says, if I had all the wealth in the world, all the celestial jewels of the heavenly planets, I could give it all just for one glance from that boy, cowherd boy, going to the forest. So he says, hey, come with me, help me take the cows. If I had all the palaces, if I had the grandest palace made of diamonds and pearls and corals and marble and crystal. I could give it all just to roam in the groves of Braj where the jeweled footprints of Krishna are. He is the real wealth. Kamaniya, he is the truly... As long as we want anything from this world, it means we don't know him. And if we know anything of him, we can't want anything from this world because there's no juice left. Kamaniya Kishore Mugda Murti and his Murti his form is mugda, is bewildering. Kamaniya kishore mugda murte kalavenu konita nita dutendra. And his face, which is like the moon, like the rising moon, beautiful full moon, Krishna is dark, and yet he's full of luster. He's dark, but he shines. Like a black pearl, Guru Maharaj used to say, there's no color like his color in this world. So dark, but he can illuminate any place. Like when Krishna's small, mm -hmm. and he wants to steal some butter anywhere, <laughs> then he doesn't need any light, anything. Mother Yashoda used to hear so many complaints from the neighbor ladies, neighbor gopis, or oh, your son is stealing so much butter and breaking into our houses. And she didn't believe her. She said, hey, if it's like that, then just keep everything in the dark. He's, my son is so small and innocent. He's afraid of a cat or an owl. If he sees a kitty cat, he becomes afraid and hides behind my skirt. He doesn't like the dark. She said, Oh, Yashode, you don't understand. Your boy, he's so full of luster, he doesn't need any light. He goes into the dark cabinets and 
storeroom and the whole room is filled with the luster just of his fingernails and toenails with the speak of his complexion. So his face is like the moon and that moon-like beautiful face, that Mugda Morte, that completely attractive, youthful, mind-bewildering face and form. His moon-like face is Kalavenu. It's worshipped by the melodies of his flute. Bilva Mungo is saying that the beauty of his face is, it's as if when he presses that flute to his lips, that the flute is singing the glories, like the sages sing the hymns to the Lord above, so it's like this flute is singing the glories of his beautiful face. Mama vachi vichim bittam murare maruimna kona pikapi kapi Let my speech be empowered to describe even one particle of a particle of a particle of his luscious beauty. He's begging for that. Let my speech be empowered. Just one tiny particle, particle. Not even a drop of the ocean of his beauty, but like where the waves are breaking and the wind is blowing and there's a mist particle blowing from that ocean of his beauty. Let my voice, my speech, my kirtan be like that. One mist particle from the ocean of the beauty of Murari. Why? Because he loves kirtan and he'll come back. Like a bumblebee in my mouth, like a lotus will bloom, and the fragrance of his own glories, his own name, form, qualities, and pastimes. Krishna is Akarshna Tasarup. He's the embodiment of attractiveness. He's so intensely, gorgeously attractive, he attracts his own self. That's why we do kirtan. That's why we sing Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram. This is our bazooka, our atomic bomb. We can pray so many things, Lord, have mercy, please, I want to serve you, I want all these things, but at the end of the day, mm -hmm. to put all these things away, it's, it's not enough. And we just sing His name, because it's so full of juice. At the beginning we said that poetry means how to say the most with the least words. The ultimate verse, ultimate poem is this Maha Mantra, Hare Krishna. Because inside of just three words, Hare Krishna and Ram, in this particular arrangement, in a circle, these words, these names are doing Ras Lila. And as we chant them, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, turn this wheel in our heart, then the lock opens, and inside of that safe of this holy name is unlimited meanings, unlimited pastimes, unlimited realization is there. So that's our hope in singing verses and doing kirtan and hearing kirtan. And especially chanting our Maha Mantra, we want to call that Bumblebee. But that's a little distance away. You know that Sri Prabhupada, in the beginning, he told the devotees heard from Sri Prabhupada that there's a particular rag, rag malar, in this monsoon season, tune, melody that in ancient times if you could play it perfectly on the sitar or sing perfectly the rag malar then you would know that it was perfect because rain would fall at the end fine rain would come and sometimes just for the pleasure of ancient kings in the court the you know, expert musicians would come and they would play and then fine rain would come and the king and his queens would clap their hands and give necklaces ah oh, the rain is falling such a sweet so you know Ravi Shankar, he played at Woodstock Festival in 1969. When I was a kid I used to listen to the recording. And you can hear at the end of the performance the clouds rumbling. He plays the Ragmalar and you can hear at the end the clouds rumbling and the rain starts to fall. And they said to Sri Prabhupada, his disciples asked Prabhupada, how can he be so good? Hmm. Prabhupada said he's played this instrument for seven lives. Kaliuga, everything is broken. This type of expertise you can't find, but seven lifetimes, so much dedicated. And then finally, his Siddhi has come. And he can play in such a way that the clouds will gather and break open and give their rain. In the same way, it takes some lifetimes to be able to play the Rag Malar of Bhajan, how to do that type of kirtan it's going to call down the rain of rag, that raganuga bhakti, that very special Krishna bhakti rasa bhavitamati, 
the Shil Prabhupada came to the West to give. But who's got it? Shil Gogavan Maharaj? I don't know, maybe some others, but we don't. It's so rare a thing. Who could do? We were thinking, if I learn to play the harmonium, if I play Rundanga, if I learn so many verses, if I do all these, learn all these things with my mind and senses, then I can, oh, I can impress Krishna. <laughs> we don't know what kind of music. Every night Krishna is doing Ras, and in Ras dance you can't imagine what type of art is blooming there, what type of dance and joking words and what type of art they're enjoying there. He doesn't need any of our mundane arts. It's like the, the hopping of grasshoppers, you know, or the, the croaking of frogs. <coughs> our greatest arts in this world. <coughs> the real perfection, the real um, melody, it's not a material melody, it's the melody of our, our longing. When the heart breaks and it's really truly longing for relationship with Him. Only that longing, only that tattva lolim apimulyam ekalam only that lobham, only greed is the entrance for that. So this week we want to speak about poetry. Why? And sing these verses. Why? Because these verses, all the verses of Rupa Goswami and Dova Mangal Thakur and Raghunath Das Goswami and all of our Acharyas and even Shukadev Goswami and everything, they're full of their mood, they're full of their longing, their acute longing. And Guru Mahaj used to say that like if you want fine perfumes but you have no money, then you just go to the perfumer, to that fragrance man or lady, and you just sit in his shop, talk with him for a while, shake hands with him, <laughs> exchange some words. When you walk out the door, you'll smell sweet. <laughs> Even if you don't have a penny, you can't afford anything in that shop. You just go hang out with him. Or else, Guru Mahesh said, if you worked making candles, you know, rolling candles, one after the next, like they make these potpourri candles and rose flavored candle and different things or rolling incense sticks mm -hmm. and so many you roll and at the end of the day you go home and <coughs> hands are fragrant <coughs> you didn't burn any of the incense you didn't light it didn't have a match to do it but just handling it again and again so in the same way Guru Mahesh said why we sing these verses why this is such a, a crucial part if we look at Sad Goswami Astakam what are the Sad Goswamis doing? What are our Acharyas doing? They're wandering through Braj Mandal and they're singing verses. Hey Rad, hey Braj Devike, Chalalite, hey Nanda Kuta. They're singing verses. Hey Radharani, hey Krishna, where are you? Where are you? Gauda Shamata Mei, Mei Priyata Mei, Rupe Kadal Hambaje. Oh, you golden and black, beautiful divine couple, when will I, when will I, when will I worship your beauty? So we sing these verses because we don't have that bhav, but we handle them. We want to associate with these acharyas who have that bhav, who have that ability to call the bumblebee of Krishna, who can call down the rain of rag. Where our life is dry, without that pure spontaneous devotion, we get up, we chant our rounds. I got my rounds done. You know, I did mangalarti. I did my duty. It's like going to job. It's going to work. We're supposed to do it, and we do it. But no rag, no flavor. No longing. Where are the hot tears? Where is the piercing sweet spear? Where is bhakti? This line is very, very deep and sweet and crazy making. If we really come in this line of Srila Rupa Goswami, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Sri Prabhupada, and Srila Gurudev, it means we become mad. No more smiling. You weep for the rest of your life and roll on the ground not knowing that your body is blowing around like a leaf in the wind of Srila Rupa Goswami, Srila Raghunath Das Goswami says that just like a vine, you know if there's a, a tender creeper in the breeze, a fine breeze can make a vine dance. But what if the forest is burning? What if for hundreds and hundreds of miles all around the forest is blazing forest fire? And these big gusts, big gushes of blazing fire are coming. What will that delicate little vine be doing? That the finest breeze makes it dance. What will it do in that fire? Say, my body is like that, like a vine in the blazing forest fire of separation from Radharani Seva. And so much longing to serve the lotus feet of Shiradha that this fire is tossing my body. And like that, he's singing these verses, these prayers, these poems. And his body is 
rolling and tumbling on the ground like a delicate vine in the fire of separation. And by that type of belonging, that type of absolute, one-pointed, exclusive desire, forgetting everything else but the hope to serve the lotus feet of the divine couple, then Sri Krishna cannot resist and he comes. And the next thing you know, there's a soft hand in your hand. There's a sweet voice in your ear. <coughs> Maybe there's a cheek on your cheek. And everything changes. Relationship is established. So we sing these verses because these verses have the power to call Krishna. We don't have, but Rupa Raghunath have, Narutam Thakur has, Sri Gurudev, Sri Prabhupada, they have. Not only to call, but to catch and to hold and to give to us. So poetry is so crucial. So many things I want to say, but time isn't there. We have a week just to try to touch one mist particle from the ocean of the poetry of bhakti, bhakti line. So I'm also praying, taking, even though I have no prayer, my heart is dry, taking the remnants of Shuddhova Mangal. I'm praying, Omavachi Vichambitta Murare Madarimna Kwanika Api Kapi Kapi. Let my voice be empowered to express even one particle of a particle of a particle of the luscious beauty of Murari. Hoping to attract him, hoping to attract myself to him, hoping to attract you to him. This is the essence of our practice. If we can get a little greed, a little bit of urgency. Urgency means an urge. <laughs> I have an urge. I'm being pulled or pushed from the heart. Not just, well, that's so fascinating. When's Prashad? <laughs> an urge, an agitation. One of the best things I ever heard from anyone was one friend of mine wrote me and, and said, oh, you're the friend that agitated my heart. And, oh, something successful we did right. Something we did. This is, was Gurudev's Dharma. My Guru Maharaj, he traveled all over this world in a, his patient campaign to make the world crazy, to make us forget everything but the desire to hold the hand and hear the voice and kiss the cheek of that Kamaniya Kishore Mogdumote that boy whose form and beauty is completely bewildered, who is the essence of everything desirable. Okay? So, I tried to come. I'm on just, I haven't spoken for five months. <laughs> I've been hearing and chanting and just in Vrindavan, and so it takes me a little while to change gears. It's kind of a trauma <laughs> the system to come out. So I'm holding on to this kirtan as my lifeline. If I can think about, speak about Krishna and Vrindavan, then this is my best hope to stay in Vrindavan even when my body's not there. Because actually, you know, the dust of Vrindavan is the right ground to grow this bhakti. We cannot grow Krishna bhakti outside of the soil of Braj dust. It's not going to happen. Not going to happen. It grows in Vrindavan. And if we can't be in Vrindavan physically, then we have to be there by mind. Somehow we have to be absorbed in remembrance of Vrindavan, of that realm, that plane, where all these words are a song, where everything is poetry. That plane where their, their language is poetry. We hear more and more about that this week, all the crooked double talk and triple talk. They can't say anything straight. Everything they say is poetry. In this world, the devotee, Sri Prabhupada said, among the 26 qualities of a devotee, there is one of them is poetic. To be it to express the mellows of pure devotion, one must be poetic. You cannot express the mellows of love of God without poetry. Therefore, poetry is necessary. So sweet and so attractive. Sometimes the devotees they come together and they share their poetry like Rup Sanatan. They would meet each other sometimes in their wanderings around Vrindavan, sleeping under different trees. And what were they doing? They gave their whole lives, they left everything to chant and write poems. Chirupa Goswami wrote one lakh of verses. 100,000 verses and more of poetry. How did he write them? He had nothing. He just had a little cope and a little cloth around his waist and a tattered, cold, tattered cloth against the cold. And he would chant in his bhajan and, what is it? Echai Gosai Jabe, Raja Kualavas, Radha Krishna Nityalila Korilo Prakash. The six Goswamis staying in Vrindavan. They manifested 
Radha Krishna Nitya Lila. They manifested how? To their writing, to their poetry. What they witnessed in their hearts, wandering here and there, so deeply absorbed in their bhajan, in that mood, they saw the eternal pastimes of Vrindavan and they manifested by writing Srila Rupa Goswami with nothing in the middle of the night. He would come out from his trance and, oh my God, if I don't catch this snapshot, then it's going to go. The next wave will come. The next beautiful, delicious vision will come and I'll lose this one. And so by firelight, some little coal was there. He would get some dry leaves and crush and throw and just for 30 seconds light would come. Some little flame would come and by that, with his pen and a <clears throat> palm leaf, their pen isn't like a pen like ours, it's just like mm. a pressing thing. They have to press the letters in there, and then later you put black on there, and rub it, and then wipe off, and the black fills in the place. You have to be so expert how not to push all the way through, and how to push right. And this like scientific code of Sanskrit, writing perfectly by 30 seconds or one minute of firelight, in the middle of the night, in the freezing cold, or whenever. How to do like that, write in a perfect verse what he'd just seen in his heart before the next wave comes and takes him back inside. He can't write anymore. So I'll speak more and more the later this week. I have to catch myself, stop my mouth, because I'm not going to be able to say everything tonight. So please come. Please keep coming. Try to catch as much as you can, because it's cumulative. Any questions? <coughs> Do we know if Purvamanga Thakur was an incarnation of any great Devi or Devta? Or he must be a Braja Gopi. His body can't be a Devi or Devata because they're also mundane. They're also mortal. And his bhav was an immortal thing. What he was expressing was so high and so pure. You know, Devis and Devatas are standing in line waiting to take birth as humans in this world so that they can do kirtan of these type of verses and these type of, and uh, come in this line so that they can attain that bhav. They don't know those things. They can't conceive of those things. Mm. Some gopi, must be some gopi. Some sakhi. Not, sometimes there's some smell of a manjari's mood. Some, but mostly he's inclined towards Krishna, so must have been some sakhi. Did you say the deva? What was that? The devas? And the Davies and devatas, gods and goddesses. The demigods and goddesses. Of the they wait to take human form? Yeah. They're on higher planets living for thousands of years without any illness or sickness, with bodies that are so fresh and beautiful. When the ladies sweat there, they smell like lotuses. They don't have to put any powder in the pits or shave any stubbles or anything. Nice. They're completely <laughs> ever youthful, ever healthy, ever fresh. And they look at us, peasley mortals living 60, 70, 80 years, you know, passing stool and sweating and every hole in our body is oozing some different type of gross substance. And they're begging and praying that they can leave that position and take birth here on this earth in a body like ours, in this Kali Yuga where it's, everything is falling apart and World War III is about to bust loose and Hurricane Sandy too is ready to <laughs> fall us down and it's all trouble here. And they want to leave their paradise and come here. Because here, this is sudden Bhumi. There's 14 levels of planetary systems within the universe, according to Vedic cosmology. And there's seven above are heavenly realms, higher and higher realms of subtle, sattvic enjoyments, celestial pleasure. And below are hellish realms, more and more dense levels of darkness and suffering. Who does really good, materially good things, they go up and enjoy, and who does really bad things, they go down and suffer the reaction, and like this, we're like a yo-yo, going up and down. But equilibrium, the perfect balance of pleasure and pain, is the earth planet. In hell, there's too much pain to do any type of meditation or prayer. And in heaven, there's too much enjoyment. They're completely intoxicated, completely mad with the pleasures there. Mm -hmm. So they can't do proper worship. And there's no sadhus don't want to go there. The sadhus who have the bhav in their heart that we need. This enlightenment is not something that we get by our own endeavor. It's something that we get like we catch a germ. You catch a cold from someone who has a cold, or you get bhakti from someone who has bhakti. And those who have bhakti, they don't have any interest to go to the higher planets because it's just a realm of enjoyment, of selfishness. So the sadhus are here on the earth. They appear here. They take birth. 
they appear, from the spiritual world, they're appearing, taking birth on this world, this sadhan bhumi. This sadhan bhumi means this is the platform of spiritual practice. And so the demigods, when they understand, like, oh, they do the math and they find out that even after 10,000 years of my enjoyment here, my time is up, my club med, my vacation is over, my karma, good karma is going to tap out, finish out, and I'm going to fall. Nothing is temporary. I mean, nothing is permanent. It's all temporary. The only thing that's permanent, the only permanent happiness, is to establish a relationship with God and go to His abode. And that's very easily accomplished in this platform, at this time, in this lineage of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. There's a rare golden window open right now for those who follow. And so demigods who've done the math and worked it out, like, we're not actually doing so well up here because this is going to be gone in the next moment we'll be beggars on the street again in Calcutta or whatever. Or even degraded below that, we could be paramecians or anything. Mm -hmm. They want to take birth as humans on earth and do bhajan. So this fits with the story you just told us. The man is down here, and he's trying to get back up. Interesting. So by doing that and getting it here, he can go to the abode of yeah. Lord Sri Krishna. He can't do it anywhere else. Right. Wow. Nice. This world also happens to be where Vrindavan is. Krishna has manifested... You know, he's opened the veil, he's opened the curtains, and he's done, he's Durgata Gatana Vidakti. He's that person who, because he's God, he can make the impossible possible. And he's taken the spiritual, transcendental abode, the spiritual world, and he's manifested it here in this tiny little, the unlimited spiritual world of Goloka Vrindavan, he's manifested on the earth planet, which is a tiny little ball in a tiny little universe. So within India, in Uttar Pradesh, within 84 square miles area is another dimension that's called Vrindavan and that dust of that place like have you ever heard of Chintamani this jewel that can fulfill all your desires every particle of dust of that Vrindavan in this world has the power to create millions and millions of Vaikuntha planets so if it has the power to create millions of Vaikuntha planets it can fulfill the spiritual desires of one teasly tiny little jiva like me so we go to Vrindavan, we touch the dust of Vrindavan, and while touching that wish-fulfilling dust, even one piece of that dust, and praying, we have hope that the impossible can be possible. That someone so fallen and degraded and selfish and rotten as me can attain the highest and purest, most exalted love of God that can actually conquer and control him. And the last thing um, you said, um, is that chapter 9? Even if one <coughs> commits the most abominable action? He, if he's engaged in devotional service, he has to be considered saintly. Hmm. Is that how you were putting it? Huh? Is that the Gita verse? Yeah. Okay. I have to read that and read the report. Okay. It's very, very subtle point and very deep. But the linchpin, the most critical thing is that person, if he's really a sadhu, if he's really truly from the heart engaged, then he will lament for his fall down. Absolutely. But if someone falls and they deny it, no, no, I will still be guru. I will still. You know, lead others. I will do like that. This is not a good sign. They are not coming under that shelter. We cannot judge that person who has an accidental fall down, but someone who has a habitual uh, addiction and no repentance. Because if, we if we repent and weep and pray, Bhagavan will cure us. He won't remain addicted. He will satisfy our longing to be healed. You know? Like John Coltrane. He was a heroin addict. You can't escape. You know, it's very difficult, especially there was no methadone in his time. He was so mad, so much destroyed by heroin. But he had come in, by good fortune, he was born in a dynasty of ministers. So his father, his grandfather, he'd heard so much spiritual knowledge from them. And so he knew to turn to God. And so he went to a cabin in the forest and just cold turkey cut his habit. And you go mad, you know, you go completely sick and rah, and hallucinations, and it's it's like a hell to come off of heroin. And you can die, even just from the sickness can kill you. But he prayed, Lord, if I survive this, if you take me out from this, then I promise I'll dedicate my art, my gift that you've given me to make music, to glorify you and make people happy. And so he did that. He, he made it, he came out the other side of that dark night, and on the other side, the first thing he did was... 
a Lord Supreme, a Lord Supreme. Mm. He composed this amazing, astonishing, celestial, wordless hymn of praise to God. Thank you. So, if we want, if we lament, if we're ready to suffer, you know, the pain of regret, if we can give up our pride and be, have our pride be crushed, then we'll be healed. Then that person is apichet sudarachara. That person is saintly, even though he maybe do something wrong. But the person who doesn't lament, who doesn't take the medicine, who doesn't open himself, and they don't come in that category. Thank you. Did uh, Bill Humago Thakur, did he live a long time? <laughs> we hear that he lived a long time. 700 years? Something like that. It's, it was a long time ago also, and it must have been a previous age, because it's ancient history. He lived a long time. He went to Vrindavan, and he stayed there, especially at Kalia Daha, the lake where Krishna danced on the hoods of Kalia. His bhajan place is there. So then it was in Kali Yuga, though, this, his... I don't think so. Oh. I haven't heard of anyone. But it was after Krishna's appearance, only 5,000 years ago. No, Krishna's... You know, the Vedas were written so long ago. Mm -hmm. You know, ancient, ancient. But in there, the Vedic sages, the verses of the Vedas are saying, we've seen so many, after they've described the worship of so many demigods and so many things, they say, we've seen so many demigods and devas and devis, and they all come and go, but there's one playful barefoot cowboy who always remains the same. He alone is eternal. So that he's eternal, you know. Krishna manifests from time to time. Bhagavatam manifests from time to time. But like Valmiki, he wrote the whole Ramayana before Ram appeared. So because the swarup of Bilva Mangal Thakur was Brajbasi, as he did his sadhana and became perfected, it came out and he was calling for Krishna. So he could be wandering in Bhardwaj in India towards the place that later Krishna would appear. Mm -hmm. But he was wandering to that place thinking Krishna's there. But that place is always it's always, always there. the same. Mm -hmm. It's always there. Even when the universe is destroyed, it's still there. It's covered and uncovered at different times, but it's... Mm -hmm. It's always there. So many before Chaitanya, if you read um, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur's Navadip Dham Mahatmya, he describes how all the different, the Sampradaya Acharyas, Ramanuja Acharya, Madhva Acharya, Vishnu Swami, they all actually came to Navadvip. Indra came there, Brahma came there, before Mahaprabhu appeared. So many Acharyas came to Navadvip and did bhajan there, and then had darshan of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Mm -hmm. Dozen, dozen examples of people who had his darshan and went to worship at that place, knowing that it was holy, before he ever manifested. Because these are eternal abodes. It's manifest to the world, to the greater knowledge, but those who are tuned in, they know. Okay. I'd like to thank Prabhuji for coming. And tomorrow's program will be in uh, Primilla, Didi's house, which is on 109th Street and uh, 101 Avenue. I forget the exact house number, but um, I'll find out afterwards and I'll let everybody know. And then Friday we'll be in Jackson Heights in L Lalita and Krishnadas' house. Saturday we'll be in New Jersey, then Sunday again in Pramila's house. And Sunday evening I need to get confirmation. I think there is confirmation. But Sunday evening in um, the 101 Avenue, 111th Street uh, Temple, near Krishna Balaam Temple. Yeah, that be nice. And then Tuesday will be in uh, Hunter College. So Monday is the only one open. So if, if anybody would like to host a program there. Did you care to hold a sing yesterday? Today? Say that again? Oh. Yeah, I called. He can't do it tomorrow. He's doing construction, they're not doing any programs. Oh, okay. So, so thank you. Okay, little kit on. <coughs> Did you want to do um, a hard thing? Okay. okay. We can stand up and. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think we could fit almost everybody in <laughs>
What's your name again, Cole? Dominic. Nice to see you. Thank you for coming so far. Yeah, I hope it's worth it. <laughs> your laugh reminds me of Dominic Marash. Blowing my nose. Dominic Marash. Well, I've just been with him for so many months, I'm probably infected with this. <laughs> That's a good infection. <laughs>